Okay. Good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, my name is Rachel Cohen. I'm the Regional Executive Director of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, or DNDI, in North America. <clears throat> First, I just want to share a few words with our Spanish-speaking friends so that they can access this discussion with our Spanish interpreter. So uh, please just hang on for one second, the rest of you. Si desea escuchar este evento en español, puede hacer el clic en el icono del globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla que se encuentra junto a las funciones de chat y preguntas y respuestas. Simplemente haga clic y podrá acceder a la traducción simultánea en español. Muchísimas gracias. And I am delighted to introduce our webinar today. We're featuring the authors of two wonderful books that came out last year that speak to the human impact of neglected diseases and of the lack of access to appropriate diagnostics and medicines for those diseases. Thank you for joining us, Daisy and Pip. We're so honored to have you. And now I'm thrilled to introduce you to our moderator for today's event. Dr. Seema Yasmin is director of the Stanford Health Communications Initiative and clinical assistant professor of medicine at Stanford University. She's worked in the epidemic intelligence service at the CDC, where she investigated disease outbreaks in prisons, border towns, and across tribal reservations. Dr. Yasmin has been a medical analyst for CNN and covered health and science at the Dallas Morning News, where she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in breaking news and received an Emmy for her reporting on Chagas disease, one of the neglected diseases that DNDI is working on and the subject of one of the books under discussion tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin, for giving us your time to moderate this discussion. And with that, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for making space and time to discuss these diseases and for hosting these authors. And welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we have a very global audience today and it's a delight to be joined by you. I love books, I love book talks, I love speaking to authors about their process. And today we have the privilege of talking to two authors who really use personal storytelling, deeply personal narratives to bring awareness to these neglected diseases. Uh, you've heard a bit about me from Rachel, but I will say to you that it was very, very unexpected for me to have won an Emmy Award years ago for reporting on these infections, which I was so passionate about reporting on when I worked at the Dallas Morning News. And I was passionate about reporting on them, of course, because as a public health physician, as a medical journalist, I knew that we were under reporting these conditions. I knew that many of these infections were prevalent, but because they were diseases of poverty, they weren't getting the airtime, the newspaper inches, the, the funding for sure that they really warranted. And so that's whenever the Emmy comes up, I'm always like, oh, it, it's a it's a delight that it was for reporting on these particular conditions. And so I'm really happy to be in conversation with Pip and Daisy today and thinking about the power of words and the power of books to raise awareness about underreported issues. Um, I'd like to introduce them now, and then I'll go through a few logistics before we dive into our conversation. So I'm very happy that we're joined today by Daisy Hernandez, who's with us from Ohio. Daisy's been writing about the intersections of race, immigration, class, and sexuality for almost two decades. She's a former New York Times reporter, and today, of course, we'll be talking about her book, Kissing Bug, a true story of a family, an insect, and a nation's neglect of a deadly disease. It's really exciting that this book um, has been recognized by the National Book Foundation and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which has picked it for their inaugural science and literature program this year. Daisy's also the co-author of the award-winning memoir, A Cup of Water Under My Bed, and she's co-editor of a book that's really special to me that came out 20 years ago, which I can't quite believe that. It's called Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. Daisy has reported for Nat Geo, The Atlantic, Slate, and she's an associate professor at Miami University in Ohio. So we'll get to speak to her very shortly. Let me introduce Pip, who's joining us from the southern coast of the UK. Pip Stewart is a British writer and an explorer, and Pip picked up cutaneous leishmaniasis 
while completing a world first paddle in Guyana, where she was unfortunately bitten by a sandfly. And Pip recounts this experience in a really powerful way in her book, Life Lessons from the Amazon. Since contracting cutaneous leishmaniasis, Pip has given TED Talks and a ton of media interviews in efforts to raise awareness about neglected tropical diseases. And she's donated half of her author fee for her book to DNDI. Before we get to meet our two brilliant authors, a couple of logistics. This webinar does have to end promptly at the end of the hour. So what we'll do is I'll start the conversation off. We'll have a few questions for Daisy and Pip, but then we really want to get into your questions as well. So please make sure you're firing all the questions towards us. You can ask a question through the Q&A feature of Zoom. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. I think we're all very, maybe too Zoom savvy these days. The DNDI team will answer any questions that are just really easy, perhaps yes or no responses while we're talking. And then I'll try and get to some of your other questions um, as I wrap up the conversation with Daisy and Pip. What you can also do is if you like a question posed by another audience member, you can upvote that so that they appear higher in the list and we'll try to prioritize those. The DNDI team behind the scenes will be filtering questions and sending selected questions to me to ask of Daisy and Pip during that Q&A session of today's webinar. Please feel free to ask questions in Spanish. We have a translator and those will be translated so that we can all understand them. So with that, let's bring in Daisy and Pip. Welcome to you both. How are you doing, Daisy? How are you? I am so excited to be here with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And Pip, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Honored to be on a panel with you guys. Um, yeah, it should be fun. It's going to be a fun conversation. So I'd like to get started with you, Daisy. For those who haven't yet had the chance to read this book, can you give us a bit of an overview about what you cover in the book and also what it was that inspired you to write it? Yeah, thank you. The book starts with a story of my auntie who grew up in South America in Colombia. And in the late 1970s, she actually became very, very ill. And, um, and it turned out that she had Chagas disease. The, it's a parasitic disease, as many of you know. Um, and it usually attacks the heart. But in her case, it was attacking her gastrointestinal system. And she spent um, the next 30 years in and out of hospitals having so many different procedures. She was very, very fortunate. Um, and in that sense, in, in terms of getting healthcare access in the US, she was also like a mother to me. Um, and we knew very little about Chagas disease. I grew up thinking she was the only person who had Chagas disease. And of course we know that there are millions and millions uh, uh, specifically in South America, Central America, and Mexico, um, and also many people in the United States who have this disease as well. And uh, but we didn't know any of those people growing up. And um, and a number of years ago, she she died. And for us, it was she died from Chagas disease. And for us, it was a huge shock. Mm -hmm. um, we I, especially for me, I just you know she was like a mom to me and sort of a you know, figure who had, while she had been very ill, she had also been so full of life. She had become a Spanish language teacher in the United States. Um, she had traveled, you know, she had, um, she had made a life even with this um, uh, incredible and, and, and just uh, heartbreaking illness. Um, and so I started to do some research into Chagas disease. Um, and I realized just how many more immigrant families in the United States, an estimated 300,000, people are infected with this disease in the US. And it really made me want to know what their stories were, what if they were going through experiences similar to my family's over the years. So, and I also, um, you know, I have an English degree, I'm a journalist, <laughs> not, not in medicine or science. So I also really wanted to understand um, these insects. I wanted to understand the biology of it and the parasite. I wanted to understand what had happened to my auntie over all those years. And so I traveled across the United States and I also traveled back to Colombia um, and met families there who are also struggling with diagnosis and access. Uh, to treatment as well. And, uh, and so the book covers this journey as almost seven year journey to, to understand this, this illness. 
I'm so sorry for your loss. You know, having read the book, she is a woman that is full of personality and character and life. And so to, you know, to have lost her, it sounds like a really huge, you know, loss for you and your family. Um, And I thank you for sharing your memories and your experiences of her with us. I wonder, Daisy, if you can just tell us a little bit more about the timeline of her illness in terms of your earliest memories of your auntie being sick and how, what kind of symptoms she had, how you remembered her being sickly, and then when she actually got a diagnosis and how that happened. Yeah, so she um, she was very thin and she actually looked like she was pregnant. And when she was first taken to a hospital in Colombia, they actually assumed that she was uh, that she was pregnant and that she was embarrassed because she was unmarried, uh, she was young, uh, very Catholic family in Colombia. And, um, and that is how she appeared. She, my family actually um, put their, all of their money together. My mother was here in the United States already along with two other sisters. They pulled their money to bring her to New York City um, because by word of mouth, they knew of a clinic that was open to people who, uh, indigent patients, people who did not have resources to pay for healthcare, which was her situation. And she was actually diagnosed by Dr. Alfred Markowitz at Columbia, what was then Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. And my first memories of her, of picking her up at the airport, as I write in the book, is that, you know, she she looks to me like um, a skinny auntie, you know, with a bit of a belly. Um, but for my mother, uh, my mother could see how much weight she had lost and how just deformed her body was at this point. And so it was quite a shock for my mother. But all of my early memories of my auntie are actually at Columbia University uh, Medical Presbyterian Hospital. It's, it's was seeing her in those hospital rooms um, day in and day out because um you know, she was quite isolated. She came from a huge family in Colombia to um, a, a very lonely hospital room, um, of course. So it was a huge culture shock for her. And then, of course, um, I was the first person in my family who was speaking English. So I was translating for her. And so at home, and how, how um, old were you at that point? Home. How old I was six. I was I was six years old. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yes, I was six years old. And this is back in the day when we did not have laws yet about medical interpretation. So right. many of us children did that work. I mean, it still happens now though. It's, it absolutely yeah. still happens now. Yes, it absolutely happens. And, and so yes, before, you know, I often say that in some ways this book began when I was six years old because I was mm-hmm. talking about Shaga's disease um, as best as I could, as I write in the book, you know, I was, I was just beginning to learn English myself. So I was kind of attaching English noun to Spanish verbs and, and making do, uh, in that way. So I was interpreting for her at a very young age and, um, and talking about this disease at a young age. Yeah. And I think in some ways that can be quite a unifying immigrant experience. I know my mother had that experience being a, a six, seven year old in England coming from India and having to translate in the doctor's clinic, in the hospital for elders, very private medical things. But at that point, Daisy, was there an inkling that this was Chagas disease? Because one of the things that I learned more through my medical reporting than, than I did as a public health physician was how long patients suffer the infection before anyone starts to connect the dots and how much damage to organs occurs in that duration. Absolutely. There's a patient who I write about in the book named Carlos, who grew up in Central America. And he was actually a teenager when he started to have cardiac complications. And I mean, he was passing out, he was uh, really suffering. And he actually was attributing what was happening to his body to being a teenager. He thought it was part of being an adolescent, that his perspective had changed, that somehow he didn't have the same energy that he'd had uh, when he was 12, you know, now he's 16. He was not diagnosed until decades later in the United States. Um, and, and honestly, it was uh, even that from my perspective was a bit of luck of ending in connection with a doctor who happened to know about Chagas disease right. and looked at him and said, yeah, why is this man in his 40s? having um, heart failure, needing a heart transplant, because that the parasite, that is where the parasite, the kind of damage that a parasite can do to the heart. Uh, why does this man from Central America who is otherwise healthy and has no other complications, why is he at this stage of heart failure? And he knew about Chagas disease, but yeah, he said, you know, 
uh, when I was, when I interviewed Carlos and spent a lot of time with him, he said, you know, there were so many, I mean, just years and years and decades, he had two different pacemakers put in and no one suggested, no one thought about Chagas, um, both in the United States and also in his home country. So that, that kind of lack of being, having to wait for a diagnosis also crosses borders. Yeah, and sadly, another unifying experience for those who, who live with Chagas. Pip, I'd like to bring you in here because Daisy, of course, writes about a personal experience, but it's her aunt's experience. You write about your own experience of contracting cutaneous leishmaniasis. Tell us about that. What exactly were you doing in Guyana and how did you first fall sick? Yeah, so da- Daisy, wow, your your aunt's story and and your your story is is incredible. Um, and yeah, to to answer your question, um, yeah, so basically, I was on a kayak expedition. It was a three month source to sea descent of Guyana's Essequibo River. Uh, it was together with two of my good friends, and we were guided and led by uh, members of Guyana's YY Indigenous community. And essentially it was living and breathing this river for three months. You know, we hiked up to the mountains um, on the border with Brazil and the Akarai Mountains. And then we kayaked back down to the Atlantic Ocean. And as I say, it was probably like the most wild place, the most wild experience I've ever had. And part of these expeditions are doing very thorough risk assessments. So we knew, you know, obviously you have to take care with certain insects and Mm -hmm. I had come across the concept of leishmaniasis, a a bite, a parasite caused by the bite of a a female sandfly, but it was something that you never think will happen to you. It's always that, oh yeah, you know, you hear about tropical diseases and everything will be fine. Um, Until it wasn't because I came back to London and I was covered in bites on this entire expedition. You know, you're living in the jungle, you're used to being covered in in all sorts of things. but this particular bite on my neck wouldn't go away. And instead it was sort of getting bigger and it was crusting over. And it kind of got into this merry dance of like pussing and scabbing and pussing and scabbing. And I thought, you know what, I should probably go to the doctors and figure this one out. And, you know, I had heard about London's Hospital for Tropical Diseases. So I duly took myself there um, where they said, look, we, we think this might be cutaneous leishmaniasis and wow. That was a moment because I hadn't, you know, until you sort of Google these things or, or hear about them, like, you know, Daisy's story, that is so abstract. Yeah. And then suddenly you're confronted with this very nasty disease. Um, and at, at the time I wasn't sure what, what sort of leishmaniasis it was. And you, you go through, there's three different types. You've got visceral, visceral you've got mucocutaneous and you've got um, cutaneous. Um, as it turned out, I had the least kind of severe form, but you know, visceral leishmaniasis kills you within two years if you don't get it treated. And I'm suddenly being told, you know, you've done this expedition and, and by the way, you might have a parasite that's eating through your neck and potentially could spread to your nose and your soft palate um, unless you have very toxic and aggressive treatment to kill it. Um, so that was sort of the start of this journey for me into like researching and understanding uh, leishmaniasis. Wow, what a journey. And and one of the things that strikes me, I'm very familiar with the hospital that you went to because I trained um, after medical school in London. Um, And of course, one of the things that comes to mind for me, Pip, is you didn't have to think about finances. You knew you could rock up. And now that I live in the States and I've lived here for the best part of a decade, it's a very different way of accessing care or even thinking about how you might access care and the fact that you have to hand over an insurance card and a credit card before you can see any healthcare provider completely colors the way that you might make decisions about accessing healthcare. Um, And I think this is an issue that both of you bring up. Um, It's never just a pathogen, is it? I mean, Daisy, Um, articulated this so well in terms of it wasn't just getting a diagnosis for her aunt there were all these issues around immigration where is it safe to access healthcare? Uh, there's issues around faith that may help or hinder us in the healing process there's gendered behavior and misogyny that we know in medical racism Um, can you talk a little bit more about this as well pip in your book um, you talk about how you got treatment as a, a white woman who had those privileges. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you see in Guyana, though, in terms of how people could 
or could not access care. Well, this was it. So once I'd gotten over the shock of having this flesh eating parasite, I started to, to do a bit more research. So I reached out to my friends in Guyana and we did this journey with a lady called Faye as well. And during the kayak journey, she'd shown me sort of five scars on her leg. And at the time I hadn't sort of thought much of it. And I, I messaged her and I just said, look, Faye, um, I've been diagnosed with leishmaniasis. Do you know much about it? And she was like, yes. Do you know those scars that I showed you on my leg? That was from the parasite. And I said, well, Faye, how did you treat it? And she messaged back and she said, well, Pip, I put burning cow fat onto my lesions in order to sear the parasite out. Um, stupidly, I asked her, you know, did it hurt? And she said, yes, Pip, it felt <laughs> like I'd been fried. Um, and so that, that was one story. And then, and then we had a, a bit of communication and I said, look, could you, could you not have gone to the hospital for it? And she was like, well, I could have done, but I live in remote jungle. It's five to six weeks away to the nearest hospital and I've got three children. So it, it just wasn't practical. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, my friend Philip, who um, is from Masakanara, which is um, the community that uh, most of the, the YY live in, he was saying that uh, they put crushed turtle shells into the lesion to cure, to cure the, the, the scab. But again, the, these local treatments may or may not be effective, but the problem comes that there's not being enough research done into it. And so from my very comfortable position, as you say, quite rightly, being treated for free in one of the finest like hospitals in London, like thinking that I'm being told that I'm getting an outdated toxic treatment that dates from the 1940s, but going, oh my gosh, you know, in a game of would you rather, would I rather have chemical therapy and be treated by free for, for, by professionals for free or burn mm. myself with cow fat? And, and that was the start for me of the injustice that is inherent in uh, neglected tropical diseases and you see it a little bit with COVID um, because it has impacted the global north yeah. people are making a noise and yet this is th these issues affect billions of people and just I, I was flabbergasted that not enough uh, is known about them and, and not enough resources sort of diverted towards it. And, and we'll get a bit more into that in a moment Pip but could you also tell us a bit about what your treatment did involve and, and how you healed? Yeah, so um, essentially it was an antimonial um, called sodium stipogluconate, um, and it, it was a, a very toxic chemical. I'm not medical, so anyone watching might be going, oh, that's not how you say it. Um, but I'd gone from being the fittest I'd ever been mm. to being told that every day for 21 days, I had to sit on a drip and be pumped full of this toxic medicine. Um, I had to have my heart checked because it can lead to sort of heart failure. Mm. I had to have my liver function checked. Um, and I'd come back with a six pack. I mean, this is not like me. I'm, I'm a cake eating girl. I was the fittest I'd ever been. But by the end of this three weeks, um, I was lying on the floor because I mm -hmm. couldn't move. My entire body ached um, and it, it, ju it just hurt to move. I was a shell of a woman. And again, I kept reminding myself through the whole of this, I am lucky. Like this is what luck and privilege looks like right now. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a really hard thing to get my head around. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Pip. And Daisy, obviously you talk about your auntie's experience, but you also speak more broadly about the issues affecting people um, who don't have access to healthcare, who do live in poverty. Can you tell us more about what you learned in terms of those living with Chagas and how they were or were not able to access care? Yeah, I really came to appreciate that accessing healthcare in the U.S. Um, very deeply depends on where you live. And when we're speaking about immigrant families facing chagas. Um, so in the United States, before you can access Medicaid, you have to be, as a legal resident, you have to be in the country for five years. So it doesn't matter that you have chagas during those five years, you don't have access to Medicaid. A lot of cities and states have workarounds with that. Um, but you also need to have the resources um, to access those workarounds as well. And to, um, and to also have a sense of agency within yourself and to have access to the English language as well. So one family that I write about in the book, um, Janet and her husband, um, Janet only became aware that she herself had Chagas disease because her baby was born prematurely, was born very sickly, or was already showing um, damage to his heart. Um, and so he was actually, took, it took a while, it took a while, but um, he was actually screened in the NICU for Chagas disease. And, and so then, um, you know, she was as well, and they both were positive for Chagas, and she needed to find a doctor 
And it was quite a struggle through word of mouth. Uh, she didn't have insurance. She wasn't signed up for Medicaid beyond that prenatal and postnatal care. Um, so in a lot of places, um, mothers do get access to Medicaid, but then it stops, right? Once the baby is born, as though that's like all the help that you will need as a, mom, as a new mom for your own care, medical care. So her and her husband were, you know, they got a list um, from the, the hospital for infectious disease specialists and they started calling. And, you know, the husband, it was, English is his second language. And a lot of the offices where, where he was phoning um, did either didn't understand what he was talking about or had never heard of Shaga's disease. And mm -hmm. so he just really um, kept striking out until by word of mouth, he found a doctor who was bilingual. Um, so there's just that language access. It's not all, oftentimes only even the healthcare part, um, accessing a healthcare institution, but also can I talk to someone who speaks my language in that healthcare institution? And then, of course, you have in California, I spoke with a number of families where, you know, it's not only getting the healthcare access, not only getting the appointments, but then um, being able to get time off from work. A lot of a lot of folks in the United States who suffer from Chagas disease are exactly like um, my mother and other aunties who were not teachers, um, who worked low wage jobs that didn't come with health insurance. And it's not so easy to take a day off, a morning off to go see your doctor. And it's not so easy to take time off to do a 30 or six day regimen. I, one doctor I spoke to, I remember said to me, you know, I have patients right now, like the profile of his patients were actually immigrant Latina women in their 50s and who were in one of like many of his patients were saving up their money so that mm -hmm. if they, because these are toxic treatments, we don't have new treatments, right? And so that if they got sick, they would be able to be off from work for two months because they don't have jobs with sick pay or sick leave. Um, so the repercussions are just astonishing. Um, and I think COVID has made more of us in the United States aware of these racial disparities, but we still have such a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, there certainly seems to be more discussion about it, mm -hmm. maybe among those who weren't considering that such a, a huge factor that, that, that you can have this virus and yet really disproportionate rates. Um, but you, you, Daisy, you mentioned the access to healthcare, but then there's also this access to knowledge in a way in that many physicians just don't have familiarity with Chagas, with leishmaniasis and its multiple manifestations. We spent probably not that long on it in medical school. And so it's really in your post-medical school training, if you're choosing to specialize, if you end up working in places where those diseases are more frequently seen, that you end up um, you end up more aware and even having it on your differential diagnosis list. I'm wondering, Daisy, what you learned um, about the public health system in the US. And I found this really interesting in my reporting in terms of did, were physicians and scientists and advocates in the community telling you that we should be doing more surveillance for Chagas and disease like it? What approaches were you hearing about on the ground that could really shorten that duration of suffering where people feel sick and then it might be years? before they get a diagnosis? Yeah, a lot of what I heard was um, the need for more funding, more funding to do community screenings, more funding for research and development, uh, more funding for raising awareness because um, especially in the US, there's just still such a lack of awareness of Chaga disease. Um, I think it's increased a little bit and we're here today, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and your reporting has made a huge difference. Um, and we still still need a lot more funding and attention. Uh, I think for me, what I learned, you know, I was coming to public health for the first time. I, I definitely came at this from a, a family experience. And I think what was shocking to me and what I write about in the book is, is realizing that in a lot of ways, we have a policy of containment rather than eradication. And so that, you know, this like Chagas disease is not going to come out of this particular immigrant Latinx community in the U.S. Um, and so it's very much contained there. But the same has happened with tuberculosis. I'm really afraid that the same will happen with COVID in the near future. Um, well, it will disproportionately afflict poor communities in the U.S. at much higher rates than wealthier uh, and whiter communities. Um, so, this, you know, I think that's something that we have to think about. Yeah, thank you. And, and Pip, one of the ways that you've been raising awareness is by doing a lot of media interviews. And you gave a TED talk that was very interestingly titled A Love Letter to a Flesh-Eating Parasite. Can you tell us why you called your TED talk that? 
Um, well, it's really interesting because the World Health Organization says one of the reasons that neglected tropical diseases are neglected uh, is that the names are often quite hard to pronounce. So Leishmaniasis, it, it's sort of, uh, people can remember a flesh eating parasite more so than Leishmaniasis. So I guess it was just trying to, to make uh, clickbaity, I guess, <laughs> for want of a better word, but it's to try and get people interested and engaged with these issues because um, I think that's that's interesting coming from like a, a journalistic point of view and a science. Mm -hmm. And that's where your skill set is so amazing is that you, you blend that sort of both. Um, but it's how to communicate effectively um, some of these big issues. And, I, you know, I, I can only speak about my own experience, really. And, and that's what I was trying to do there is sort of tell tell the story through my poetry, through my writing. Um, and yeah, just try and highlight an issue that, that needs a bit more attention. But again, I, and I'd, I'd really like to hear from everyone on the webinar and you guys, you know, you can make a lot of noise, but what's the best way, what, how to best focus this attention yeah. in order to get results? Because otherwise it's just a lot of hot air going out, isn't it? So, you know, what is most helpful? And I don't know who the participants are particularly on the webinar, but you know, what, it, what do people want to be hearing from? me and people with these diseases or um do you know what I mean what's most effective yeah no that's a really nice segue into the, the question that was next on my mind Pip which was a question for you both about the writing of this and thinking about this as a journalist Daisy um as an author Pip in that and I tell my journalism students this all the time like you care deeply about this topic how will you make your reader care we generally write about things that we're so passionate about we're so troubled about how do you make an audience that may or may not be able to pronounce this or have heard of it care and I'll be honest with you, one of the ways I did this <laughs> when I was reporting my series for NBC and for the Dallas Morning News was I didn't just write about humans, I wrote about dogs. I wrote about really, really cute dogs, really well-loved dogs who were members of a family in Dallas who got shaggers. And I think the family ended up calling their dog like the $50,000 dog or the $100,000 dog because of how extensive those vet bills were. This dog nearly died from Shagas. This dog had multiple pacemakers put in. Um, and one, I was just like taken aback by how much money this family invested in this dog's well-being. I mean, I love dogs, but like, wow, there are humans dying because we can't get them like $5 antibiotics. And this dog saw the best veterinarians on American soil. I can tell you that because I met these vets and they were amazing. But I'm wondering, kind of putting your question back at you, Pip, and let, maybe let's go to you first, Daisy, is as you're writing this book, clearly you're telling us such a personal story about your auntie, your lived experience. Who were you envisioning as your audience, as your reader, Daisy? And, and how were you thinking or were you thinking about ways to really draw the reader in and make them give a damn about a disease that they just may never have heard of? I was, absolutely. I was, act I was thinking about multiple audiences. Um, you know, one audience that I was actually thinking about was someone like me who's in a Latinx family in the US who maybe has a family member or themselves has Chagas disease and they don't know very much about it beyond what maybe their doctor or what they find online on, on the CDC website or uh, the World Health Org. And so, so part of it was um, thinking about, yeah, that reader who maybe does know or has been impacted. And so how could I make the science more accessible? I completely agree with what Pip is saying around all the names, because people always say, do you pronounce it Shagas or Kajas, you know? So, um, so some of it was explaining also just uh, the biology of it for that audience and just how complex this parasite is, you know, and how just how many species of kissing bugs we have or triatomine insects that we have both in the US and in Latin America. So I was thinking about how to make that language, it, it, um, you know, accessible. So a lot of it for me felt like a bit of a translation project, but instead of translating with Spanish and English, it was translating with science and the language that the rest of us talk <laughs> the rest of the time. So I definitely thought about them, but I also thought about um, readers who, you know, would not be interested in neglected diseases mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. And for them, and that's part of the reason that I ended up writing so much about my auntie, because we did have a complicated relationship. It was not, um, it was not a like loving, perfect relationship. We very much were at odds. She did not accept me being a cool woman. 
Um, she really struggled um, with so much of what I <laughs> stood for politically. And so, so we had a very difficult relationship. And I thought, you know, everyone has a family member they've had a difficult relationship with. Sometimes it's your mother, sometimes it's an auntie or father, someone, sibling. So I felt like everyone can understand that that perspective and also that the person being sick doesn't make them an angel either. Um, and I was really happy to see on social media, people kind of really connecting with, um, you know, that that personal story, that personal element of, yeah. of the experience. And, and Pip, you mentioned WHO saying maybe these infections are neglected because people can't pronounce the names. I mean, I disagree with WHO a lot. And I think I have to disagree there too. When people want to pronounce something, they'll find a way to pronounce it. They'll give it a nickname. I think much more these <laughs> diseases are neglected because they affect black and brown people, because they affect people who live in resource poor settings who don't have lots of money for expensive treatments. You touch on some of these things in your media talks, in your um, your TED talk, and your writing. Um, can you say more about those disparities? And because really, we're not just trying to get people to care about a pathogen, are we? We're trying to get them to care about the underlying sets of symptoms and structural issues that make someone vulnerable to these infections and make someone vulnerable to living a life where they're not getting the best available healthcare. Mm -hmm. How do we change that? <laughs> Absolutely, because as you say, these are not sort of problems of the poor, these are problems for humanity. And, and that was the, the biggest thing, you know, when you look at leishmaniasis, the people most likely to be affected are they're, they're, they're going to likely be poor, malnourished, displaced, or live in poor housing, yeah. um, and, and very often live in remote communities. And, and that's sort of part of the problem with leishmaniasis and finding treatment that is affected, effective for poor and remote communities. And I think, you know, often I, I do these talks and, and people say, oh, what was the scariest thing you saw in the jungle? And I go, oh, you know, we saw crocodiles and like, uh, or caiman rather, and um, all, all sorts of things. But the, the biggest and the scariest thing was actually that sort of global health disparity, yeah. um, the injustice that is inherent in the system. And in so many ways, um, as I write in the book, this, this journey was like a very big, eye-opening journey of discovering for me and in so many ways like where I encountered my privilege I mean even traveling is political um, in ways that I hadn't really um, considered as fully as I should um, and so suddenly to kind of come back and look at the inherent racism that is existent in global health as well um, it, it was really eye-opening for me as a, as a white privileged woman it's something I should have been more aware of but I wasn't um, and then you talk to, to my friends who are, you know, still in communities dealing with COVID while they're trying to like sort out the flood that has just ripped through their entire village. Um, it's sort of uh, things like leishmaniasis are sort of not exactly top of the priority list, especially if the lesions heal. And that's part of the problem with cutaneous leishmaniasis. These lesions very often um, do heal up, um, but it's a secondary infection further down the line that's a complication. Now, having access to treatment, I was able to try and address that early, um, but most people who are affected with this disease don't have it. And funnily enough, when I, I did a lot of, of stuff on social media around getting um, diagnosed and I was trying to bring it to, to light in an entertaining sort of way, I suppose, um, but I received a message that I never thought I'd receive from a doctor who said, um, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm really glad this happened to you. Uh, because most people who get the disease don't have access to media um, they don't have access to treatment and I was like that that is just there's something very messed up about that so yes to your point I think there's a much broader issue um, that so many of us are not yet awake to and should be yeah and I, you're right that the injustice is disgusting and, and frightening but I think what's also frightening is how large swathes of the public can therefore feel like these issues are far removed from their lives. Um, and I think sometimes the issue might even be the fact that there's the word tropical in these um, in this group of diseases name. I was reporting in Texas, you know, um, and these were infections that people were getting probably in Texas, we were pretty sure. And other times it was because of migration patterns and travel. But again, how does that not affect 
everyone. Absolutely. Um, and climate change and the movement of insect populations. You know, this is an issue. This is going to be a global issue. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. it already is, but is it going to be an issue that affects the global north? And, and you know, I think in so many ways, it is absolutely disgusting that big pharma haven't prioritised it because there's no money in it. Um, and and that, that to me was... Uh, more worrying than actually getting leishmaniasis is like yeah this, this is messed up yeah and, and so much of that agenda setting does depend on what infections affect people in the global north uh, because that will then dictate what kind of funding and resources get plowed into certain disease uh, research areas um, but you mentioned big pharma um, which makes me think about Pharma Bro and anyone who's been watching Inventing Anna on Netflix about Anna Delvey might have gotten a little rude reminder about the existence of uh, the guy known as Pharma Bro, Martin Shkreli. Daisy, you have a story about Martin um, Shkreli. Uh, you wrote a piece in the article that was called Pharma Bro's Latest Move Targets Latinos. For those uh, in the audience who are lucky enough to not know about this guy. Can you tell us a bit about him and then tell us your story? You are lucky. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so this pharmaceutical executive, you know, probably people might remember him because he really made headlines um, in 2015 when he went after um, a life-saving drug for HIV patients. Uh, and that got him that nickname of Pharma Bro. got him the nickname of most hated man in America by one of the media outlets. Um, even Donald Trump actually, uh, you know, made some comment, negative comments about Martin Trelli. And I wrote about him specifically because um, what he did was he came after one of the drugs that is available um, for Chagas patients. Um, and so benzidazole is a medication that is not a cure for people in the chronic stage usually, but um, definitely helps in the acute stage, definitely helps children. Um, and, and can have a huge impact as well for people in the chronic stage as well. So it was not available at that time in the US, the FDA had not, uh, it had not been brought up yet for approval. So he decided to go after it because, and this goes back to what Pip was saying, part of what um, was happening in the US was that there was, they were giving financial incentives to companies that would develop um, medications for neglected diseases, but a lot of the companies were not developing anything. They were um, basically bringing old drugs uh, to the market or to the FDA and then uh, making a lot of money with these vouchers that they would then go, turn around and sell. And so Marin Shrelly, our, our farmer bro, um, realized this and told his investors that he was going after that. Um, and I did write a story for The Atlantic about the racial impact of that decision. This was not just going after any drug. This was not going to affect a bunch of different people in the United States. This was specifically going to affect poor Latinx immigrants in the United States, who at that point were already struggling to access this medication, right? You have to find a doctor who knows about Chagas disease. You would then have to find a doctor who is willing, was willing at that time to go through the bureaucracy of getting the medication through the CDC. And I did interview those patients who had gotten access and that access was free. There was not a charge. Um, Martin Shirelli wanted to price it a course of treatment at $100,000 mm -hmm. um, for patients who are on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote about that. Um, he, he tried to initiate a Twitter conversation. I think that's what he was doing with me. Um, and, and we had an interesting exchange because, um, you know, what I, you know, I, I, I finally, it was my chance to interview him because my calls had gone unanswered to his company. Um, but he was right in, in some of what he told me, which is, you know, there's no price right now, right? There's no price on this drug in the United States. So I can price at whatever I want, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I am glad to say that he did not, he and his company did not get the FDA approval for that. Um, DNDI was also at work with another pharmaceutical company um, and um, and made a, anyway, ended up getting FDA approval. So we do have this drug and another drug actually that are now FDA approved in the United States. Um, and also and that- And they don't cost grand. What? And, they and not priced at $100,000 at all. And, um, and but that and has also included an investment from the pharmaceutical company into um, raising public awareness around Chagas disease, both here and in the Americas. So I think that level of commitment is really important. Where is he now? 
you know, I would have to go and look. He was in prison, unrelated to unrelated to Chagas disease and his efforts there, but he was arrested on securities charges. I actually, I actually like to tell people he was arrested the day after our Twitter exchange. So I don't know if karmically that has anything to do with it, but yes, don't mess with me on Twitter. So yeah, clearly you were shooting. But yes, from- he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was arrested for um, for securities uh, allegations of securities fraud, and so he was in prison. He has uh, quite, um, uh, uh, yes, quite quite an interesting development after that. One of the things that I write about in the book is is also how hard it was to uh, to get a jury for his trial because so many people knew him as the guy who had gone after the drug for HIV patients. They didn't necessarily know about the Chagas disease part. But they did know about that. And so many of the jurors in New York City, knew either they themselves had struggled with access to medication, to affordable medication, or they had a family member who had struggled with getting access to medication for many different illnesses. And so they very much saw him as um, you know, symbolic of, uh, of just a failed industry in the United States and, and globally, I would say. And then there was the whole Wu-Tang Clan symbol that we can leave that for another day's debate. Um, Pip, Daisy mentioned DNDI's role there in terms of um, advocating for access to care and research. How did you come to be connected to DNDI, Pip? Um, And how did you end up making that decision about donating half the proceeds from your book to the organization? Well, essentially, I was looking around for information um, as soon as I was diagnosed, and I came across the DNDI. And you know, looking at the research that they're doing into like providing treatments suitable for for remote areas. And um, I was just I was just really impressed by the organization. And and then to hear about all these other neglected tropical diseases. And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, I'd never heard of some of these things. And I was like, this is woeful. Um, Why have I not heard about it? So I sort of got to know some of the the members of the organization. I really like what they stood for. Um, And yeah, I realized writing this book that you know, travel is an absolute privilege, which is why I wanted to sort of give half my author's fee to the DNDI and half to the community um, in Guyana that guided us, because I'm like, without, you know, both sets of people, I wouldn't have the privilege to be able to do these sorts of things. So it's sort of, yeah, it was it was a journey of discovery for me in many ways. And I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Well, on that note, Pip, there is a question from an audience member who asks, are you still in touch with the community that you traveled with? And are, is that community still facing these same problems in terms of getting treatment for leishmaniasis? Yeah, I'm very much in touch over sort of Facebook and Instagram um, and WhatsApp, actually. And um, yeah, I mean, I think my impression is um, from the, the conversations around it is that leishmaniasis is something that's just present um you just quite crack on like i said they have recently faced flooding um covid has been a massive issue for the village you know it's a, a, a village of 200 people um so a lot of the villagers have gone to their farms which are very much in the jungle to try and uh, limit contact with each other mm-hmm. um and then you know it's been interesting talking about how they've been dealing with covid um and i was told that you know there's a particular tree that they've been using to to sort of boil up the bark as a preventative uh, measure against COVID. So, you know, these conversations are still taking place around healthcare and, you know, just just as mates really, like, how's it going? Uh, my friend Nigel, who's 16 is like, what does it smell like in, in, in the, by the coast at the moment? Like, t- tell me all. So yeah, we're very much in touch. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm hugely grateful for, for the friendship that we made. And perhaps after the pandemic, whenever that might be, do you have plans to return? Do you know what? I would love to. I've got a little daughter now since uh, I came oh, back, and yeah. one day I would I would love to go. Um, I would love to go back and, and see everyone and and see the village and find out how people are doing. So yeah, it, it would be, but maybe sort of more of a long term plan potentially. Yeah, for Pretty sure. Uh, um, I remember trekking through the Amazon and walking behind a friend, and he was covered in bugs at one point. And so I had the bottle of insect repellent spray, but decided it, instead of spraying it, I would just like smack him with the bottle. To <laughs> it with that. And he was like, you're supposed to spray, you're not supposed to hit people. And I was like, but there's so many on you. And I can literally see all different types of bugs feeding. So not for the um, non-brave, but it, it's a definitely exciting place to hike. Um, and to, to do an expedition like you did. 
Um, Daisy, a question for you from a parasitologist, um, from Rebecca Barksby. She says, one thing that really struck me as a parasitologist was Daisy's relationship with the triatamine bug and how that seemed to go from fear of the bug to wonderment as Daisy delved deeper into her Chagas research. I'm curious to know whether understanding the biology of the disease helped Daisy deal with and talk about the trauma that Chagas caused her family. And this can also apply to Pip's experience too, but let's start with you, Daisy. Yeah, it's a beautiful question. And absolutely, there was a huge difference for me when I started working on this book, because part of what I write about is that, you know, we didn't know anything other that it was some kind of insect. We didn't know the name for it. We didn't know what it looked like. Um, uh, some Actually, at some point later in my auntie's life, we did get a picture of these insects. But but we just, what I grew up with was basically all the women in my family telling me that all insects were dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was just kind of a very, just a huge fear that an insect meant disease, meant almost dying, meant being very sick. And so it was just a huge, very general fear to grow up with. Um, and so for me, when I started writing on this, I felt like it, it's kind of still a shock to me that I wrote a book whose title is The Kissing Bug because I was sort of the last person to be interested in anything around insects, but I think it made a huge difference for me to move from that place of fear into curiosity and wonder. I actually think, oh, I might've been a science journalist, you know, if I had not grown up with this level of fear about the insect world, because it is so fascinating. And one challenge that I did have was trying to um, share that with my family. Like, I cannot say that my mother and my other aunties are as fascinated as I am today <laughs> by these insects. I would like, they're still, they don't want to see pictures of anything. Um, so that part was like a little bit more challenging, but I think for me, one of, you know, what it helped me to appreciate is just uh, kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, just how powerful it is to have knowledge and how the, the power also of having words and of having ownership. I think this was coming up in the chat box too, with the names of diseases. Um, but being able to know, oh, you know, these insects have all these nicknames in different parts of Latin America, mm -hmm. and they have a scientific name as well. And that 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 knowledge is just um, so powerful and definitely took me from a place of fear to a place of empowerment and um, and yeah, empower. Yeah, a place of empowerment, I would say. I mean, I would say you are a science journalist now, so you have to just own that title. <laughs> Can you tell us, Daisy, why the triatamine bug has that slightly creepy name of the kissing bug? It's actually a really complicated history. So a lot of times people think that it's um, that it has to do with the insects uh, targeting the face or targeting the lips and so forth. But these these bugs will actually pretty much bite you anywhere and everywhere. But in the late 1800s in the United States, there was um, a little bit of uh, an epidemic of bug bites in the summer of 1899. And no one could find out exactly what insect this was. And this started in Washington, DC. And then um, there have been some questions around whether there was actually an epidemic or more of a psychological epidemic where mm -hmm. every bug bite that summer was being blamed on something. And so it was actually reporters, it was journalists who began to nickname it the kissing bug because uh, what the bites all had in common is that people's lips would balloon as like an allergic reaction. And so um, uh, like the head entomologist uh, at, at the US uh, Department of Agriculture at that time kind of proposed a sort of a, a number of insects that were maybe responsible and the triatomy insects, one species in particular that was well known in the Southwest at that time was one of those that was possibly um, the culprit. And so years later, when Dr. Carlos Chagas uh, made his discovery in Brazil in 1909, uh, and U.S. newspapers began to cover it. They sort of, I, I believe what happened is they went into their archives and they pulled up that nickname uh -huh. and called it the kissing bug. To, again, to make it a little bit more accessible. Triotamine insect is a bit of a mouthful. And as you were saying, Dr. Tu, before, you know, there isn't necessarily a desire to talk about the, these illnesses that disproportionately affect uh, brown people uh, and black people around the globe. So they pulled out the kissing bug and that um, got currency and that was sort of the the reference um, that we've had. 
the names of things and the origins of names, I think, are very interesting and very telling. Uh, Pip, what about you? Did understanding the biology of your illness, of understanding the parasite, help you deal with some of that trauma that you experienced being so sick? Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and actually, that's a, that's a really interesting question because I think, you know, cutaneous leishmaniasis is the least severe of all the kind of parasites in fact, yeah. disease, whatever. I, yeah, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a medical uh, person here, but it is, it is the least severe. But that being said, yeah. there is still very much a mental toll. And, you know, I felt that and I had access to treatment because essentially knowledge is power. And it's, it's, it's good to know why there is a gaping hole in your body and what's causing it. Um, but so too, there's power in treatment and more power in treatment than I would say in the kind of wonderment of, of knowing what's happening. Um, and I suppose the other thing I, I kind of want to mention is actually the stigma in certain parts around the world of having like these lesions and the scarring that's left. You know, I'm really fortunate. Mine's mine's on my neck. I, I call it my like a love bite. And to your question earlier about why did I call it a love letter to a flesh eating parasite? Because I look at this as a love bite and, and what can be achieved from a place of compassion. Um, and actually to, to anyone who's on the webinar working on these issues, huge, genuine thanks, because, you know, what you what you are doing is, is like genuinely life changing, um, because as a patient being sat there being said, you know, there's a parasite in your body that and it's kind of, your flesh is kind of being eaten away. It's terrifying. I'm not going to lie. And yeah. and and the, the repercussions going on from that. Um, and again, you know, I've got access to doctors, I've got access to therapy, I've got all this stuff to, try to support me. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to in short that, you know, there is power in knowing what's happening, but it's also uh, support is the, the most powerful thing. Yeah, and, and medical treatment is really empowering. Everyone should have that. Um, as authors, as people who think really deeply about words and the power of language, uh, there's a question from Bernardo Moren, um, which I'll ask, but it makes me remember being at CDC and not in any very concerted way, but many of us would complain about some of the language of public health and how unhelpful it was to public health. So one example, even the language around surveillance, we meant it in a way that was like to do with counting and capturing disease case counts but that can be quite a terrifying word and quite sinister connotations especially to some of the communities that are most affected by some diseases so Bernardo Moren is saying could you tell us more about the issues with that and he's saying quote unquote tropical category in terms of public and global health are there any known efforts to change or question some of the epidemiological categories like tropical epidemic, endemic, et cetera? Maybe I'll go to you first, Daisy. Yes, I try as much as I can to actually not call it, a neglect, to not call Chagas a neglected tropical disease. I like to say it's a neglected disease, period. Um, because when my experience is that when people hear tropical, well, when I start talking to people about Chagas who don't have any relationship to it in the US, they immediately want to know if they're going to get it, how they could get it, what they should be, you know, they, they immediately think of themselves and their family and their loved ones. That's where their minds go. And what I found was that whenever I would use the word tropical, it was just immediately telling them, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with you here in the United States. So it was localizing it and making it an other, something that happens to other people in other places. And so I wanted to really push back against that. So when I say neglected disease, there's sort of a different response. Oh, like, why are we neglecting it? What's going on? You know, there's sort of like more, it opens up to more questions as opposed to shutting down the conversation. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, I could say more, but um, I'll yeah, let let, thank you so much, Daisy. Let's try and wrap up. I'd like to get your final thoughts, perhaps a minute each on um, a thought that a suggestion that's come up in the comments, that I think is important to address because it's about race. And so Priscilla saying we shouldn't make this about race. It takes power and leverage out of the discussion. Um, Priscilla saying that Chagas and other NTDs are not a problem of brown and black people, but a problem of all people living where these infections are endemic and neglected. I'd like to get both of your thoughts on that before we wrap up, Pip, briefly. I would say these are definitely problems of humanity and that kind of broad capture of humanity. But I think we need to be realistic and say, actually the communities that are being affected most um, tend to be black or brown. And, and actually 
there is a problem and I think we need to be open and address that sort of head on um, whilst broadly providing the best treatment for everybody. Thank you so much, Pip. And Daisy, briefly. Yeah, it's such a good question. I definitely don't feel like, um, and I've made it an issue around race. Race is very much a part of it um, on its own, at least in the United States. People who have Chagas disease are Latinx immigrants, um, many of them undocumented, many of them in poor communities as well. Um, so there's an intersection as well of race and economics and citizenship access. Um, so, but I wouldn't say that it's us who are making it. It's um, that's the reality of it. Instead of shying away from it, I actually do want to bring focus to it because I think it actually does move people. It can move people to take action um, when we do point out the, the racial disparities in, in, in global healthcare. Thank you both so much for making time to talk about your books and your journeys today. Thank you so much for writing these books. And to everyone who joined us, thanks for your attention. Thanks for caring about these diseases. And thanks so much for your questions. You can find out more about the work of DNDI by going to dndi.org. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and read these books. Thank you. Thanks both. Bye. Thank you, everyone.